SB Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Voices of Santa Barbara. I'm your host, Alex Medajian. And today, I am interviewing my very, very first guest, the former uh, host of this very show, Professor Mark McIntyre. Wait so, a second, wait a second, wait a second. I'm still the host of the show. Well, what are you doing? Hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. We're, this uh, is ridiculous. Before we get this into, is a coup d'etat. Before we get into anything really crazy, yes. how was your week? Well, Alex, actually, you've landed on something very important. How very important. Really? Ah, good. <laughs> good day to you, folks. Yeah, we just put a little gag on you here. So I thought I'd have my guest, Alex Madagian, actually open the show by interviewing me. And because <laughs> <laughs> I wanted, to, yeah, <laughs> I've been looking for this. Uh, I've been looking forward to this show for a, a long time, over a year actually. Alex Madagian is my guest today, um, and he's probably one of the most interesting people here in Santa Barbara that I've met in a very, very long time. But before we get into seeing to uh, Alex uh, and his history and his story and his legacy and where he's going and all that. Um, I just wanted to, to answer his question. I had a very good <laughs> well, week. about time. I know. I had a very good week. I think we all had a very good week uh, this week on um, uh, at, at court. Uh, and I'm speaking especially today to the historic uh, announcement of the Janus decision. Uh, let me let me, let me me ask you a few yeah. questions about sure, yeah, this. Yeah, 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 yeah. What exactly is the history behind, your personal history behind this decision? Oh, you know me too well. You know me too well, Alex. <laughs> well, 1986, I was part of the Beck decision, which was the precursor to this decision, the Janus decision today, and the Beck decision, uh, Charlton Heston and I uh, worked very hard on it. We filed an amicus curiae brief with the Supreme Court on the winning side. We got a very nice 5-3 to three decision. Today's decision is 5-4. to four. Okay, no problem. We still won. But the, the issue is whether or not individual workers have the right to refuse to pay for political organizations called compulsory unions uh, that are acting against the will of that individual worker. That's the common predicate of the two cases. And what's historic about today, Alex, is that uh, not only do you have the right to refuse full membership uh, in a labor union, uh, a compulsory labor union at your work site, that was the Beck decision. Now, with the Janus case, you don't even have to associate with the union at all. You have to pay no fees whatsoever. The conservative majority of the court uh, said that unions' contracts and negotiations over pay and benefits were inextricably linked with its broader political activities and concluded that workers had a limited constitutional right to not underwrite such speech of the labor unions. The case specifically examined union fees paid by non-members. And Judge um, uh, Justice uh, Sam Alito wrote the decision today at the uh, Supreme Court level, and his quote is this, This procedure violates the First Amendment and cannot continue. Neither an agency fee nor any other payment to the union may be deducted from a non-member's wages, nor may any other attempt be made to collect such a payment unless the employee uh, affirmatively consents to pay. In other words, Alex and listeners, compulsory union membership and the fees associated with that compulsory membership are gone. O V E R. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah, baby. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Over breakfast, you were telling me <laughs> that. You pay for breakfast. Oh, I know, I know. I know, I know. Well, say, so yeah, you owe me one. I get it. I know. I know. Uh, when you were um, involved in the Beck decision yeah. in the 80s, yeah. 30 years ago. Yeah, 86, yeah. You said that there was over 60% union membership. Among workers. No, after after World War II, there was sixty percent, uh, almost sixty percent of of, of uh, American workers were unionized. Uh, by the time I was on the Screen Actors Guild Board of Directors, that had dropped to uh, that had dropped to eighteen or nineteen percent when I was there, and then by the time I left, it had dropped to eleven percent, and okay. then it dropped to eight percent today. So, so the the dramatic slide in union membership is colossal. So, being that only currently eight percent of American workers are yep. part of a union. Right. What is the significance for people that are not part of the, you know, 92% of America? What is the big 
deal about the that? The big deal is you do not have to associate with people you don't want to associate with, mm-hmm. i.e. Uh, labor unions. Even if there is a labor union contract a- at your workplace, you mm-hmm. don't have to associate with it. So this is both a First Amendment and a 14th Amendment issue, okay? And there are 5 million people. The, 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 the name of the union that was actually sued by Mr. Janus, um, it's, got a funny, it's got a funny acronym, uh, AFSCME. It's called the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. This covers teachers, firefighters, hospital workers, ambulance uh, uh, paramedics, uh, even homeschool teachers. And I know you're homeschooled, and we're going to yeah. get into that segment. Uh, we have a whole segment about homeschooling. Oh, today. we'll talk. I know. <laughs> but, but you know that, that, that this union, this parent union, this, this colossal umbra, umbrella union, um, they, they, try, they have been trying for many, many years to force homeschool teachers into a union contract. Mm-hmm. They've even tried to force uh, 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 medical professionals that take care of the elderly in their, uh, home care people. They've been trying to force them into a union. And the reason why is because union membership is declining. So on an even bigger scale, since they're... Um, now the compulsory union is dead. Right. What exactly does that? Where's the money going now? Where Where did it go? Oh, it, it went worked. exclusively. It went exclusively uh, to uh, support uh, Obama and Nancy Pelosi and uh, who's that other uh, lunatic, lunatic person from New York? Oh, uh, Waters. Yeah. The, okay. The, the one that wants people. Schumer. To sp- yeah. Schumer. All those people. Yeah. Now, they, sometimes they would give a token donation to a random Republican just to keep the book straight, just to make it look like they were fair-minded. But I can tell you, as a member of the Screen Actors Guild Board of Directors. Uh, uh, that uh, the the, the uh, all of the political spending that would go on by a labor union uh, uh, goes to Democrat, liberal, socialist, communist, Marxist uh, uh, causes, campaigns, and issues. So now that they've essentially cut them to the knees, the mm-hmm. unions, the yep. big big donors, because if you look at who where the money goes, the yep. de- most of money in politics is from unions. I believe. Uh, not that- well. Yeah, at, at, from from the liberal side. This okay. is. The, I mean, a lot of it comes from George Soros. Oh, sure, sure. Know, people yeah. like that. But but in terms of the average uh, rank and file, yeah, definitely has been coming from from unions. And there are five million less uh, 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 possible contributors today than there was before this decision. So uh, so with this right being that. this mighty punch to the gut, mm-hmm. this is effectively. A crip, not not quite a crippling blow to the Democrats. They'll find they'll find another way to get money. As Julius Caesar writes in his uh, Gallic Wars, if you want to defeat the Helvetians, you attack their supply trains, mm-hmm. and you wipe out their supply trains. And for years, the Republicans have uh, avoided attacking the supply trains of the unions, but in one fell swoop, uh, uh, with a, t- a, t- a tendency from the Beck decision, the Supreme Court has completely unwound that and attacked the supply trains of unions, because it's compulsory. Right. The reason why this has been struck down uh, is because you cannot be forced to contribute to campaigns, causes, and issues that you disagree with in conscience, mm-hmm. as, as Thomas Jefferson uh, 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 quoted uh, saying, that this is unconstitutional. And this is exactly what uh, Alito has, has said. So it's been a very, very good uh, week. Uh, in oh, yeah, court. I've been having great interviews. The other, the other, uh, what was the other case that you were following at the Supreme Court? Now I'm interviewing you. Go oh, ahead. right, right, right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one, one case that has been piqued my interest, which is mm. I don't quite remember the name of the case, unfortunately, but they recently uh, ruled in favor. Uh, of how I, I was hoping they would rule. It was against uh, Attorney General Bracera, and uh, I forget the name of the organization, the National Family uh, Somethings. Uh, well, essentially what the ruling is, is that pro-life pregnancy centers, pro-life clinics mm-hmm. do not have to advertise abortion places. So if you're trying to, you know, save a child, mm-hmm. you don't have to, or you don't have to advertise this is where you can kill your child. Right. So, so the analogy would be if you if you go into a dealership to buy a Buick, uh, they uh, don't have to. Th- they don't have to say, "Hey, the Chevrolet is right yeah, yeah. across the street." Yes, yeah. you want to go over there. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. I mean, even on that level, it's already ridiculous. Right. It's ridiculous. But, w- but when you take it up a whole nother level to mm-hmm. life or not life, right? You know, right. it's like trying to go to the hospital and they advertise hitmen. Right. <laughs> why would? You, why? 
<laughs> that is yeah. Dead. Now that was a severe. That was another five, five, uh, five to, to forty. That was a narrow one. That was a very narrow. Well, one. The, all of them were this week. Yeah. All of them were this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other one was the uh, uh, Trump uh, his travel ban on some That's a big deal. predominantly Muslim countries mm-hmm. uh, that was upheld because it was. Uh, I think Judge Roberts, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, wrote that decision. And said it was clearly within the province of the, well, the president is, of the United the States. The thing is that it's it's kind of like Obamacare and the Affordable Health Care Act. Mm-hmm. You know, the, it's not a. It never was a Muslim ban. Nowhere in the legal print is mm-hmm. it Muslim. Yeah, but I mean, that's. It is what it is. All right, I'm going to seize control back of my show. Okay, you don't mind that, dude. Uh-huh. By the way, we want to say a special hello to a mutual friend of ours, Diane Dodds. Oh, well, how are you doing, my dear, dear Diane? Dodds. <laughs> how are you doing? I know she's listening because she wants me to ask you a couple of questions. So oh. some of these questions are coming from Diane. What on earth Diane. did you pull on me? Anyway, we're <laughs> going to take our first break now. I am Mark McIntyre, and I've seized control of my show again. Our way from Alex Madaji and my special guest. We'll be right back. Thanks. And we're back. We're back. We are back. It's the Voices of Santa Barbara, and our special guest today is Alex Madagian. Now, the first thing Alex is going to tell us is that he's a starving Armenian. No, and I'm hungry. What? You, you just had breakfast. What By are you way, talking I'm, about? I'm also Armenian. Did you know that? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, that's true. Now, let's, I, want to, I want to talk about... Uh, Alex is a recent graduate of Santa Barbara uh, City College, and you majored in what, Alex? On paper, it was communication. <laughs> Um, I, I took, what do you mean on paper? Well, I took I took five uh, no uh, six classes in political science. I picked up a from Doctor Eskandari. Well, five five from Eskandari. Five <laughs> and <laughs> from, one from um, uh, it was Andrea Hopt. Oh yes, Andrea Hopt. Yeah, online. Hopt. Yeah. Very very, ni- very nice. Very yes, nice. Very nice. Yes, yes, both both very um, nice. Yeah, very, very nice, nice professors. Yes. Anyway, um, so on paper you were a communications major, but you had a right. lot of courses in political science, mm-hmm. and uh, you have appeared before the Board of Trustees of City Colleges twice. Yes, and uh, you made a protestation there. You you uh, you you made a famous quote, which was uh, cataloged in the news press. And uh, well, would, why don't we back it up and start with where I started with, and then you yeah, how to... did you? Yeah, go ahead. You start with where you're in. Well, okay, I started going to City College. And after I graduated, so you were homeschooled. You were homeschooled. Twelve years. That's correct. Twelve years. Yeah, yeah. And that's... and so after that, you you never went to a public high school. Not not that I can remember, unless someone drugged me and dragged me over there <laughs> without me knowing. So uh, what were you expecting when you got to uh, Sibley College? Well, it's uh, unlike homeschooling. You know, there's a big giant building, mm. brick and mortar. There's right. people that have spent their whole lives studying X, Y, and Z subjects. Right. There's Big books on in big libraries right. and all paid for by tax dollars. All you know, all this stuff, <laughs> all this stuff. And I'm looking at the giant library and the giant learning center and the giant classrooms. Yep. And you know, I'm just kind of floored. Like, there's so much to learn. I have so much to do. And mm-hmm. that's it's, that was my initial, mm-hmm. um, you know, going there. I'm going to become a grandioso, a, a, a Michelangelo, and right. all this stuff. Right, right, right. So I start learning. Yeah, you know, I know, and one of the reasons why I went to community college is because I didn't know what I wanted to major in, so I figured I could just study stuff around. Um, and Take I, a philosophy class, let's say. Yeah, do, do this, do that, you know, <laughs> something like that. That was that was actually one of the best and worst decisions is taking a philosophy class. More on that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I the first semester I settled on communications because I like talking to people. No. Yeah. You do. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> I can't I, even I, believe that. I love You're it. You're such a shy person. I know. It's tough to get me out of I my know. shell. Oh, yeah. Your mom and dad. Well, you see, that's the thing. That, that was what bothered me. Is I'd say about four out of five of the com professors. <laughs> I mean, not certainly not all, but definitely most were just. Well, they're academics. They weren't. They didn't bedazzle me with their communication skills. Some were very good yeah. at interpersonal communication, yeah. at all sorts of you know broadcasting or whatever. Right, right. But I was just shocked at how they tried to turn communication into some sort of science, as though with studies and surveys. Oh, surveys. And oh, yes, studies. yes. They could studies perfectly have shown. Yes, yes they, that is the shown. mantra: is that we can find the yes, perfect theory yes, yes. to explain how to perfectly Everything. communicate. Yes, it's all and I'm science. sitting there. Yeah, and I'm sitting there going, "You guys can't even, you know, make a, you know, uh, have a. De- they don't. They. I. I was detecting certain telltale signs of bad communication. Mm. And that's mm-hmm. not to say everyone in the comm department is 
awful at communication, but I was shocked at how they weren't above average in necess- in terms of communication ability. Mm-hmm. Some were, some were. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong, some were. Mm-hmm. Nevertheless, I was still shocked at the average or subpar communication ability of that. All right, department. now you made a statement. You made a statement which was widely cl- quoted and is often uh, brought up to you that you you could have learned more uh, by yourself than you've ever learned at City College. <laughs> now, this Diane's that's one of Diane's questions to you. Okay, I hope you're happy, Diane. Okay? <laughs> I asked him the question. All right, what do you got to say? Well, that's yourself? a great question. What do you got to say, dear Mrs. Yourself? Dodds? Yeah, what do you get to say for yourself? Well, the re- usual misquote is that, Alex, how can you say you didn't learn anything at City College? That's not true. I learned quite a bit. It's right. just nothing of what City College intended me to learn. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I mean by I could have learned more on my own is that I'm used to being self-taught. Right. Give me a book. I'll read it, and I'll figure out what the book is trying to say. Before you hit City College, how many books have you read per year? Oh, anywhere from 80 to 100. Easily. Okay. I can tell you as a professor, well, former professor of philosophy, we'll get into that a little later. Uh, I can tell you that uh, my average student, uh, that uh, non-homeschool student, maybe if they read, <coughs> excuse me, two books, two books a year, that would be that would be a high rate. And here you are homeschooled and you've read anywhere between what, 80 and 100 books? That's about right, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So You're a voracious reader. You're articulate. You can read, you can write, you can think, and you can do all three at the same well, time. This is another big difference is that I would very much look after older people <coughs> and I would try everything I can to get as much wisdom and as much information from them as possible. I'm constantly talking to, you know, old geezers like you. I know. I know. And, you know, trying to get as much I'm knowledge I'm the oldest geezer. Yeah, I'm the oldest geezer. No, I'm not the oldest geezer. Oh, no, you're not the oldest. I got many, many, many contacts up my sleeve. Now, why do you hang around old people talking to old people? Because, because for the simple <laughs> reason... <laughs> Well, as an old What's person, wrong with you? You need to socialize with your own, with your own uh, drugged out, uh, sex crazed uh, millennial crowd. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, <laughs> I am the oldest twenty year old out there. Okay, you I, are. You're an old. I've soul. been told. I've been told that I'm a 80, 80 years old, but and that might be true. I think you're older than I am. Something actually. like. <laughs> really the thing are. is, why in the world would I talk to people who are? Equally as clueless as I am. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm uh, not. Dude, no, 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 no. Like, uh, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to millennial bash because uh, I do really. Oh, millennial bash. No, I mean, I, I do support. I do like young people, you know, and I do. Or I you say, tolerate them. Yeah, you, well, let's be honest. You tolerate them. I, no, they're they're just like me. The difference between most people, <laughs> my age and myself, is that I genuinely know I don't know what I'm doing. I'm totally, <laughs> totally clueless. And older people are just better at faking it than I am. <laughs> we're all actresses, you know. Oh, absolutely. We're all so, actresses. Some are better than others. Some are, yeah. Yeah, some are better than others. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so when when you were homeschooled, you were used to uh, uh, you were used to reading, writing, analyzing, and learning on learning how to learn on your own. That's correct. And you get to City College, and you get what? What What did you find when you get to City College? What I found is they were trying to give me a checklist or a step book mm-hmm. or you know or a little step by step checklist on mm-hmm. how to do how to learn and i'm sitting there going i already know how to learn stop teaching me how to learn now they might teach me some little interesting things on the way but it's yeah. like this is stuff i could have picked up by working a job by do reading you know a book on my own time right. why am i reading a textbook right. that's telling me stuff that i easily could have figured out just by engaging with this activity for five minutes. Right, 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 right. You know, now, I'm going to get into something else, and that is that uh, when you were homeschooled, you also were involved as an Eagle Scout uh, in the Boy Scouts of America program, that's correct, which yeah. now has uh, gone the way of the dinosaur, because now it's going to be <laughs> uh, a, 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 a uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, not bilingual. <laughs> Co-educational. Co-ed. Co-ed, yeah. Co-ed. So, so it's, it's going to be the Boys that's, Girl that's Scout. That's in February, though. Is it February be, 2019. It's a, what's it going to be called? Scouts? Uh, Scouts, Scouts BSA. To what I... What and, do you mean? Well, what, well you have to B, understand... What does the B stand for? I don't BSA. Know. Look, look. Well, you see, the thing is, I'm 20 years old. Yeah. And all, once you're 18, you're out of the youth of the Boy Scouts. Right. 
Boy Scouts. Right. But um, I was majorly involved in the Order of the Arrow, which is the right. Honor Society. And that, right. my, my age limit gets bumped up. So what was the thinking 21. besides uh, no longer having a place where boys can be boys? Is it because boys, being boys, is a, a male privilege, a white male <laughs> privilege uh, indoctrination center? Is that is that the reason why the political correct uh, mafia has decided to destroy the Boy Scouts? Well, let me tell you something that's been true forever. Yeah. And that's the Boy Scouts is turned into a top down organization. Mm -hmm. The people at the top, they read headlines of the New York Times and the this and the that. Mm -hmm. And they read these big things and they say, this is how the wind is blowing. Ah. And yes. unfortunately, though, because they're in their nice, you know, offices and wherever in some big city, mm -hmm. they're not spending time with the boys in the troop. Yeah. Once you get to about, I mean, there's a few steps above and below mm -hmm. and it changes from locality. Mm -hmm. But once you're at high end as commissioner, a Boy mm -hmm. Scout commissioner, maybe a few steps above, um, you can still be engaged with the scouts. But mm -hmm. once you are in an office and not actively with Boy Scouts, taking them on trips, mm -hmm. talking to Boy Scouts, listening to their problems. Mm -hmm. That's when the disconnect happens. That's when problems sink in. Right. In our next segment, we're going to examine what are the principles and the values that you learned both as a homeschooled individual and as a Boy Scout and as a person who's active in the Christian community here in Santa Barbara. I am Mark McIntyre. This is Voices of Santa Barbara, and I still am the host of the show. <laughs> <laughs> For now. We'll be, we'll be right back after these messages. Have the most interesting discussions during oh, the break don't. with our engineer. It's not with me. Dr. Dugan. By the way, Dr. Dugan <laughs> has his own show, as, which is called Tell Me Your Story. I've actually been a guest on it. Mm -hmm. And he didn't throw me out. He didn't say you can't eat at my restaurant. He didn't even no. shoot you. No, he didn't say you have to bake me a cake, <laughs> but you can't eat at my restaurant. No, he didn't do that. He wanted to make his cake. <laughs> he, wanted to, he wanted to eat his cake and have it at the Richard, same time. Richard, someday we should record the, the stuff we talk about in the break and run that as a show. It'd be great. I'm back here with uh, Alex Madagian, uh, one of my very favorite people. I'm very, very fortunate that the feeling is mutual. That he asked me to be the faculty advisor. This is when I had a real job as a <laughs> professor. Uh, <laughs> uh, he asked me. Well, you tell the story. All right. Why all right. You, all why right. did you start your club and why did you ask me? All to right. Be all right. All right. Oh, calm well, down. get busy. Oh, okay. Right. The clock is ticking. Anyway. anyway, what happened is, as I said in the previous segments, I was getting more and more fed up with kind of a sledgehammer approach to teaching me things rather than it's just called indoctrination well you know you, you, yeah <laughs> essentially it, it, it's you have to believe x y and z and if you don't you're crazy and stupid and right. we you know don't even bother saying or explaining right. a different opinion because we're not going to listen to you right and that's what bothered it didn't bother me that i was being challenged i actually very much appreciate it one class i had a a um just a a, a total religiously atheist professor. I mean, <laughs> that's probably the best way to put him. I mean, this guy worships at the altar of atheism every day. And so he made, uh, he made his atheism a religion? Essentially, yes. Yeah, okay. it, it, as contradictory as it sounds, he was able to bridge that gap. And yeah. anyway, yeah, yeah. long story short, I was so fed up with his rhetoric because yeah. it, it had often he would go off on political tangents that had nothing to do with the material. Right. He would constantly berate and degrade not only people that I love and cherish dearly, per, you know, uh, everyone that holds this view, yeah. and also would mock students, but he would all d do it such a forceful way that unless you had a very, very outgoing personality, you would he would go unchecked. And, and a thick hide. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, and what course was this? This was philosophy. Uh, philosophy. Philosophy 100 uh, with Professor Joe uh, White. Uh, Joe uh, White. Uh, Joe, the legendary Joe White. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Now, he, he recently retired. I was in his last but class. But wait a minute. In his defense, doesn't he have the right to do exactly what he did? In oh, yeah, class? sure, sure, yeah, okay, sure. Right. So the, you're not bitching about that, right? No, 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 okay. no, 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 no. He has the right to do that. Yeah. Totally. 100% I believe okay. that. I agree with you. 
Um, and actually, I, I will throw him another um, point, of, point of point is he would call on me. Yeah. And I would be his greatest critic. <laughs> and a lot of people in the class, because there's about 100, 100 people, almost 200. Yeah, it was a BC forum, right? No, no, no. A, oh, a to 11. 11? Okay. Biggest room in the college. Yep. And, you know, people would come to me in private and go, I never considered what you just said. Mm -hmm. And I would prov mm -hmm. provide counterpoints. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually have a whole blog post on that. You can find me on my, uh, you can follow me on my blog at The Vigilant Bridge Builder. And what's it called blog again? Spot. The Vigilant Bridge Builder. So if I were to Google spot. Vigilant Bridge Builder, I'd get to your blog? Well, let's throw in Alex Bedogian. And the name of your blog again is what? The Vigilant Bridge Builder, I think blog we, spot. I think we've hammered that quite enough. Yep. Let's move on. <laughs> Just a little plug in. <laughs> follow me on Twitter at Alex, at Alex Bedogian if you want. <laughs> Any, anyway, I can tell you're a communications man. Well, All right, okay. Anyway, yeah, so, yeah. so long story short, I got the big thing for me. So wait a minute, he actually did you a favor. Professor White was doing you a big favor. Yes, he drove me nuts. He was making you defend your views. Correct. Went, well, correct. That, absolutely, he did. Yeah. But for me, God love him for that. For me, the, I hate to say that to an atheist, but I mean, you know, oh, God love an atheist. Oh, oh, oh. For for me though. For me, though, the big thing was there were other students there that would never have heard an opposing point of view. Because they were weak. Well, no, it's not that they're weak. It's just they haven't read anything. Well, and, that's true. Yeah. You know, they're just sitting there t as a sponge taking it in. Right. And they're not, they're not taught to right. critically question their professors. They want to get through the class. They yeah. want to get their B or their C. Sure, yeah. They want to move on. They want to go yeah. to four-year college. They just want to get out of there. And right? the thing is, they're going to carry what that professor says with their whole life. And it's very likely they'll never challenge it again because mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. was not challenging to people who already agreed with him right. not not remotely okay so this wound you up this this yes. triggered you to do what to do what well i wanted to start an organization that had liberals and conservatives atheists and libertarians people, yeah. Athe yeah and people from all sorts of faiths Homeschool, all sorts of yeah atheists, school, public school right er, as the most diverse club on campus ideologically diversity diverse. of diversity of ideas absolutely okay. i wanted the most so right so what did you do well i <laughs> i was I, re I recall turning in my final to the I'm professor the philosophy professor you yeah. have to, to joe white yep. marching straight down to the information desk yep. asking i want to start a club they said, okay, S send him right over, um, sent me over to Amy Collins' desk. Right. I sat down and I told her, I want to start a club. Yeah, she's wonderful, by the way. Oh, she's, she's a terrific person. Amy Collins, uh, she, she runs the student she really does love, office. She yeah, loves office the of student light, and she's just a great, great person. I know, person. I yeah. know. Great, great I'm asset of the school. Yeah. Anyway, so I figure, okay, I'm probably going to get myself into a lot of mess, a lot of messes. And I, because well, I'm, yeah. I, I'm an extremely conservative person yeah. and I, what I really wanted is some professor to get my back because I need someone to sign the piece of paper. I wanted someone to, to sign. To become an official club. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Someone that would green light what I want to do. Right. Give me lots of, right. lots of autonomy. Facilitate you. Yeah. Yeah. And still be an advisor, yeah, but yeah. not to push their own agenda. Right. And I'm thinking, oh, goodness, is there anyone in this school that would have my back? Right. So, so you, ask, you ask Amy? The, I ask her, is there anyone <laughs> remotely right of center? She looks at me for one second and goes, <laughs> she looks at me and goes, oh, Professor Mark McIntyre. Oh, we're getting rid of him. We're, <laughs> we're firing him. Hold on. We're getting there. We're getting him. <laughs> so I meet with you. We start a club. Yep. And it goes really well the first semester. But we only lightly dabble in politics right. in our own private meetings. We didn't have any events that directly dealt with politics. Right. And for me, that was a big issue because everyone in that school is rapidly against Trump. But the sad thing is none of them have talked to Trump supporters. I myself am not. Uh, in, in you were a never Trumper. You were a never In 2016, Trumper. I was never a Trumper. You know what converted me? What? Joe White. <laughs> You're a philosophy professor. I kid you not. That guy spent 20% of every lecture ranting about Donald Trump in a mm -hmm. philosophy course. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that had to well, do with that was, it. Well, the same thing was happening in chemistry, biology, yeah, history, effort, yeah, physics. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I so. came there as someone who was very happy with my decision to not vote for Trump. Right. 2016. Right. I remember that. Right. But going through that class and being so forcefully tried, indoctrinated, I realized... I can't take this anymore. This is, right. I just can't, this, this, this is ridiculous. And I was so f full of, 
angst and just exhaust from yeah. dealing with this nonsense. Yeah. I really understood the need for this change in America. So there was a lot of peer pressure for you to accept the anti-Trump, the yes, but the, but the, the, the sad thing is, the very sad, yes, ex all those things, but the yeah. sad thing is all of those critics had not engaged with Trump support. Now, my whole family supported Trump, and most right. of my friends did. Right. So I, I, I got a great exchange of ideas. The people I met in the Boy Scouts, the people I met at school would, mm -hmm. you know, give me great criticism. Mm -hmm. Some people in Boy Scouts and some people mm -hmm. in my family would give me great reasons to vote for Trump, but I, I decided not to, and I was content at the time. Mm -hmm. But now, I mean, the way things are going, unless the people at the educators, not just at SBCC, but all around the country, realize yeah. what they're doing, yeah. I'm going to vote for Trump in 2020. Yeah. You guys need to get on that. You need to change your message. Now, the name of your club was uh, was was called uh, the uh, Santa Barbara City College Critical Thinking Club. Okay, And and a as your advisor to that club, we, we had a very productive year, I think. I think you did a great job Ooh, yeah, as the founder and the chairman. And you uh, you sponsored many events. Even after we got pushback. Yeah. Even though you got pushback, yeah. But, but uh, you had atheists i can remember atheists in the room liberals in the room uh, uh libertarians in the room homeschooled people non-homeschooled people i can remember that 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 table uh we had about 12 people on a regular basis uh, uh and then you had a lot of people who were supporting you with uh, the public events that you sponsored you sponsored a stem uh, uh a science technology uh, which was mostly put on by my my vice chairman when yeah when chen oh yeah what a Amazing. What marvelous, ma He's marvelous gonna, human being. That guy is going to yeah. really rock the world. He's I, rock I'm so world. happy to know him. Yeah. Very privileged. And so, you know, I, I, we're going to pick this up on the other side of our break, but I just want uh, to remind our, our viewers, uh, viewers, I think I'm on TV again. You know, I don't even know where the hell I <laughs> well, am. You, you know what? You, you know what? You got the voice was, for it. Now that and I'm the face for radio. Now that I've been declared a philosophical moron by my <laughs> department chairman, I don't even know what room I'm in. Oh, we'll get into that, won't we? All right, we're going to be right back after these messages. Stay with us. Okay. You missed another great discussion. Oh, right break. another one. Oh, God. Really? really? We I should, know. They should yeah. pay us by the hour. We should have Richard Dugan interview us. Yeah, they, they should, should pay us when we're on <laughs> and off air. Well, double. Yeah. We should get paid double. Absolutely. We, get we, should get, Absolutely. we should get paid in the first place. So this club that you started, that you founded, uh, it attracted immediate attention. It, it was the most successful uh, new club uh, student organization on campus. You uh, you came runner-up to the uh, Associated Student Government Award for Best best Club of the Year. I think you lost to the Robot Club. No, right? no, no, the Neuro Club. The Neuro Club, okay. Which is which is a phenomenal <laughs> club. I think it is a good out. club. Yeah, they, yeah. they do work very high. They deserved it, by the way. But anyway. Anyway, uh, so you sponsored several events. I remember the, one of the most successful events beside the STEM event that you that you did. Uh, Diane, Diane just uh, Diane just said, "Great, she's uh, listening." <laughs> Thank you, Diane. We know you're listening, dear. <laughs> Stop texting him. It's, I know. He, has, okay. he, does, no. he never turns off his phone. No, I, no, you can text me. Oh, I call you in the middle of broadcasts all the time. I know. So, yeah. I know. <laughs> but anyway, so so one of the, one of the most uh, one of the most telling. Uh, 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 events that you sponsored with your club was an epistemology. That's theory of knowledge for those That's of you correct, who yes. are in Loma Linda. Uh, if you live in Loma Linda, you know what epistemology is. But anyway, uh, it's the theory of knowledge. And so we had uh, Professor Mark Bobro, who just fired me. He's, he's the chairman of the philosophy department. Right. We had Dr. Joshua Ramirez, who's the chairman chair of, of the psychology, psychology department. department. And Dr. Rene Napoleon. Napoleon, who's the chair of the chemistry department. Right? We also had uh, Melanie Eckford Prosser. She was the moderator. The moderator. Right. And she, she's from the English par right. department and the director of the honors program. Yeah. Who was the other person you had on the thing? Uh, some some whack job. I think his name was Mark McIntyre. Yeah, it was a <laughs> real whack job. They fired him, didn't they? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They got yeah, yeah. yeah. One of, the, most, right one out of the most interesting things about that show was about yeah, it was a show <laughs> about that was uh, Doctor Napoleon. Who uh, filed? We were one of the people who filed uh, Title Nine uh, complaints against me later on. Uh, uh, we were talking about uh, about uh, uh, whether or not uh, mere assertions uh, are, are constitute proof or anything, and um, I don't know how it came up, but uh, she was arguing with me, and she said, "Well, I don't know what the PH stands for in my PhD degree." 
You know, you know where she learned that. You know, you know who taught her that she should question that. Who? Joe White. She was, <laughs> she was in the same class with me. Yeah, she had never. T- okay, so here's a person who got a PhD degree in chemistry and do- in chemistry and does not know, did not know, probably still doesn't know what PH <laughs> stands for, and she was taking her first philosophy degree ever in a college from Joe White. What does that tell you about the state of PhDs in this country? Well, today, let me tell you something. I've always loved philosophy. I know, especially you know. before Joe and philosophy has always <laughs> philosophy has always loved you. I want you to say that. Oh well, it's it's a That's mutual right. thing. That's right. That's but, exactly right. Be, well, I, I I I'm a bit of an old person. Oh, you are so old. And I I, yeah. I really do like the definition of philosophy being the brotherly love of, of wisdom. wisdom yeah and that's well wait a minute now that's very sexist it's, it has nothing to do with brother no 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 okay? no 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 shush no, no. you oh shush you no the, i want to be political it comes it comes show. from the greek word philos right. which is basically a deep friendly a friendship love right and for me that's always been a very powerful thing to have right uh, be on friends right friendly terms with wisdom right but and what, it does but, not matter what kind of uh, discipline you're in, right. that's something for every... It doesn't even matter if you get a PhD. Right. That's something that's a basic human. You should yeah. love wisdom. And I, I tried to find out during that uh, during that event that you sponsored, uh, the epistemology event, I tried to find out why so many of the social justice warrior mafia at Santa Barbara City College, <laughs> why they are re- religious and rigid empiricists in the classroom, whether it's chemistry or it's biology or it's physics, why are they so religiously, empirically demanding in the classroom, and then when it comes to accusing a man of rape, mere accusation constitutes proof. Well, it's because most of them are atheists or agnostics. And well, Why is that important? Hold on, hold on. Because, because they don't believe in a God, all that's left is them. Oh. And see, this oh. is this is something that I've known. I mean, there's oh rampant elitism at the college. This isn't true for all professors, but definitely the more senior faculty, tenured, it's more difficult to be humble. And there are exceptions, to, mm-hmm. be, to be sure, but a lot of them act as though they are better than the students. And it's quite heartbreaking to see that in action. I Who do you think is running the college right now? Who do I think? Yeah. Certainly is not. Uh, Dr. Beebe, who is the president, yep. um, he's doing his best to make he's a good several. Man. Yes, he's doing his best. I, to I make... hate to curse him by baptizing him, <laughs> but he's a good man. Oh yeah, he's yeah. How how dare you? I anyway, know. the the I'm poor, probably going to get him fired by poor, saying that. Poor Dr. Beebe, though <laughs> he he has to balance between uh, the community, right. what the community wants, the board of trustees, right. and what the professors want, and the academic senate, and the academic senate, yeah. Which you know essentially represents those professors. They mm-hmm. they really only do a good job of representing the senior tenured uh, faculty, yeah. not the uh, adjunct. Ju- ju- they just, do a miserable just, job. Just so that our audience knows, there are 523 uh, ac- uh, adjunct professors, part time uh, professors. They have one seat on the academic senate. Okay, mm-hmm. there are 317 full time members, and they have 22 members of the academic senate. Now I ask you. I ask you, where's the equity? We hear so much about equity on that campus. Well, There's I, even an equity room. I, There's a room that you can go to to get equity. I, I told you. I told you. They really do believe that they're better, and it's very disparaging. No, they, I, they actually believe that they're a nation state mm-hmm. and that they can supersede the Constitution of the United States. They can pass whatever regulation they want. Right. right. Well, well, you know, getting rid of you was necessary because you... <laughs> Because you point this out to them. And you know what? The, you were just saying earlier how uh, they're rigid empiricists, rigid social scientists. In the classroom. In the classroom. Yeah. Not behind closed doors. They, there was a, a huge email thread all after me, me as a person. Yeah. Now, you were personally attacked by Ellen Carey, as who's the, the head librarian, right? She, she attacked you. Me. She attacked you let me, in the all-campus email. Let me roll it back uh, a little you roll bit. It back. Okay. I You're went the, the guest. The I guest. went to the Go board ahead. of trustees. Yeah. And I made us just not even five minutes. I, I went for about four minutes right. and I pointed out to them this one fact. This is something I still stand by today and I will not change my, my word choice. The most discriminated people at Santa Barbara City College, it's not the, not the black community. It's not the LGBT community. It's not the, the female community. They are marginalized in many different ways across the country. But at SBCC, the most marginalized students are the Christian students, 
the homeschooled students, the conservative students, and the libertarian students, and especially the Trump-supporting students. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've met an openly Trump-supporting student at SBCC. No, you'd be ridiculed. They are terrified. Yeah. They're absolutely terrified. They never share their opinion. Even in my own club, which their whole thing was all about diversity of ideas. So how did you get attacked by Alan Carey? Well, I made that speech to the Board of Trustees. Yep. And then um, the good uh, Dr. Eskandar, I decided to open a conversation over the faculty email. This, this the is all faculty email, which is not available to students, correct? No, no student okay. supposedly read this. Yep. Um, there were, I had a guy on the inside. He would forward me um, all their emails, which are public access. And right, they're publicly ho- available. Hopefully they, they realize that everything they have are publicly available. Anyway, yeah. uh, Eskandari made this long, and keep in mind, I'm in... I was in five classes with this guy at the time. Yeah. Five paragraph, long email. Basically, I can't believe somebody would say, what do you mean we discriminate against conservatives? What is he talking about? I don't know. <laughs> That's kind of what he sounds <laughs> it's like. It's a good imitation. I like that. Look, I've been, I, I took the guy for a long time. I, he, so how did Alan Carey get involved? Well, at first it started off innocent. It was an innocent discussion of, well, you know, there are some students that do feel that way. Right. You know, there are some students where they won't say anything in class, but I can right. see their papers. They right. clearly do have opinions that right. they don't want to share. Right. Which, you know, and some of them would say, this is a problem we should consider. Right, 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 right. right but right. then it started getting more and more out of hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, one professor um, used a lot of venom on me and said that essentially that I was ignorant and I need to eat my humble pie and as an actual quote, I need to become a gay atheist with social leanings you to understand to be, their problems. So you can't understand... Which is ironic because Unless that, you become a gay atheist? So he's basically implying I have to choose to be gay. So he's I implying see. that... Uh, an atheist. Gay, and an yeah, atheist. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I mean, yeah. go figure that. But so, get to the Ellen Carey thing. we got two minutes. Yeah, then, then she... Then Ellen Carey, the lead librarian, mm-hmm. is a long, long... You know, how I'm white and I'm this and I'm that, which You're is... You're like, privileged. Yeah. yeah, I'm privileged. Right. It's, it's super ironic because in my speech, I actually mentioned... Middle Eastern, so yeah, I mean, Northern there's Arab. A, yeah, there's Actually, a, there's a, Arab. yeah, Armenian specifically. <laughs> I'm, I'm 95 percent Armenian. Anyway, um, and then I get told this and that, and it eventually reached zenith when one professor suggested that I may have mental health issues for not understanding the full scope of the problem. Right, and that event it got so out of right. hand. Both the vice president. And the president. president stopped in and shut it down right. because this was way too out right. of hand. But yeah, one, one professor did name drop me to the whole 1,000 plus faculty. Right. So they all realized it was me, Alex Madajan, right. that said this. And I still stand by it. And I'm more than happy to talk with any person that still is confused as right. to what I meant. And you were or why attacked in person and, uh, in a venue that you had no access to. Mm-hmm. You could not reply. Mm-hmm. You could not defend yourself. You no. could not even respond. No. Could not. Okay. No, nothing. And no professor was willing to... To take your side. To ta- Well... Except professor- the one they fired. Well, yeah. <laughs> See, the thing is, <laughs> the, the problem is, is that there, no one wanted to support me publicly because of what you did to Michael Shermer. All you did... It, Defend during, him. Yeah, Defend, is, yeah. Is, and yeah. during that incident is you gave him a chance to say, look, this is my side of the story. Right. No one was willing to do that to me because all the fire that you took for it, all right. the fire. And to, a certain, <laughs> to, to a certain extent, I, I, I'm sympathetic to them. Yeah. But um, that's the climate of SBCC intellectually is absolutely yeah. no diversity right yeah. of center. There's an old Chinese proverb that was given to me by a student who wrote her term paper on the execution of her great-grandparents at the hands of Chairman Mao. They were hung uh, uh, in the village square because they were Christians. And she wrote in her term paper, there's, a, there's an expression, the nail that sticks up is the nail that must be pounded down. And I am the nail that sticks <laughs> up. <laughs> How dare you stick up. How are we doing that time? We got, we got another minute? We got well, 30 seconds. Okay, so the next segment, I'm going to prep up for the next segment. This is our last segment, segment coming up. It's going to be the legacy segment. And man, do you have a legacy, all right? Uh, oh, thank you're going to you. be leaving the area. You're going to be probably entering. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's not get too into it. No. We've got to bait the hook. Oh, I'm Don't ba- you know I'm, anything about communication? I'm, look, I lost the worm. I can't find the worm for the hook. So <laughs> Maybe I should you be know the host we're gonna of the take show. A, yeah, we're going to take a break and I'll find the worm. All right, we'll be right back, folks. <laughs> bye bye. This is the most fun you can have uh, with your clothes on here in Santa Barbara. Well, it is radio. So <laughs> it hey, is radio. hey, well, 
<laughs> you're, you're 73. Keep yeah. everything on. Thank so you very anyway, much. So anyway, uh, this is our legacy segment, our most popular segment uh, uh, with our listeners. And uh, Alex Madarjian has been my guest, uh, the starving Armenian and the uh, the the campus rebel on Santa Barbara City College. This, no, or? we can't. You already... <laughs> You already paid for one thing, okay. and so you're leaving the area. You're getting out of here. You're finally, uh, you're, you're empty. You, you, the nest is going to be empty at your house, at least of you. Uh, your brother uh, Jonathan will still be there, and your younger brother Gregory will. Well, still Jonathan's be there. moving out late. Oh, that's so, right. Soon after me. You but know. where are you going, Alex? And what do you? What, what are you going to? What's going to be your legacy in life? Well, let me roll back a little bit because you have to jump ahead a little bit. I, I mean, have a habit of doing that. Yeah, you know, let me roll back, <laughs> among other things. Yeah. Let me. Um, anyway. Uh, what I, as you, uh, what, there's many, many, um, different ways that I was smacked around for my club because see the, the very nature of my club being a club that represents all ideas or does its best to represent all ideas is that you have a opinion that maybe most of the campus likes and you also have an opinion they don't like mm -hmm. because I would have opinions hosted there that, and including myself, opinions people didn't like, there was a lot of pushback. Uh, for example, uh, the most outstanding club award. It wasn't, they were not having to do, I was in the uh, ASG meeting where they were debating who to give it to. It was not a debate as to which club was the most meritous, but which one was the worst. Anyway. Where are you going? Well, I got so <laughs> sick and tired of this nonsense. I applied to several colleges and I just decided to not go to any of them. I even got scholarships to a couple of them. Got I'm, accepted George Mason, didn't you? George Mason, Wheaton, with a scholarship, ten thousand, no, twenty thousand dollars scholarship. Right, to why are you not going to them? The reason is because I'm done with academia for now. You're done with academia for now, right? The the environment I noticed gave me it was just toxic. Mm. I wasn't learning like I was mm. when I was learning on my own. Yeah, I want to go yeah. really work in the real world where real things happen. I really want yeah. to do real change, mm. and I really want to make this world better. I really do want 